person, he's up for for, for ten years on a, on a charge, he'll serve five and then in jail, and uh, that's, that's not in accordance with Jewish law. The claim is made that you know, you can't hand over somebody to the government maybe for a monetary infraction, but when you're talking about a criminal infraction which clearly forbidden according to Jewish law, there is no such prohibition. Now, that's not quite true. There is such a view in halakha, but it's a minority. I'm not weighing in on whether it, whether it should be decided in halakha or not. There are voices that will repeat it. I don't think that it's the majority view. Even if it would be, even if it would be, almost everyone I know, and everybody I know who's serious in halacha, still has a problem in the following scenario. There's somebody out there who's guilty of some criminal activity. Forget about abuse. He's guilty of some, I don't know, larceny or, or whatever. The way to stop him is to go to the police, he'll get arrested, he'll be tried, and he'll be sent to a, to a, pretty rough prison where there is a good chance that he will be raped or he'll be killed. Is it still okay? So here, every decisive that I know of, either hands or whores, and says, no, that's a real problem. I'm not so sure that that's okay. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that there, the claim that Nisira has, has is, is perfectly okay when you're dealing with criminal activity is not, not true. Again, it doesn't mean anything when it comes to abuse. When it comes to abuse, because the, per, the party, the abuser, is a public menace, you suspend the prohibition of Nisira and you go anyway. I'm interested in the theoretical because in the zeal, to talk about how this is a mitzvah and everybody should get into it and everybody has an obligation. I believe that there are some halakhic categories that are getting blurred and distorted, and this is one of them. Here's another one. Lashon hara. So I said before that Lashon hara, evil speech, no problem, as long as it's for a positive purpose. Right? That's an established halakha. But it's not true. The Chafetz Chaim, who wrote the work on Lashon hara, has you know, I forgot the number, five or six or seven conditions that have to be met, even when you're telling Lashon Hara for a valid purpose. Many of those uh, conditions are not met, especially when people get together. If you came here because you thought I was going to give you names and addresses and incidents and everything, and you know, oh, you should know that. This guy used to live here ten years ago, and this guy is here now. Does everybody in this room have a real need to know who the child abusers are? I think not. I think parents do. Certainly principals do. Certainly people running the community do. Does everybody on the block need to know, have the same need? I mean, maybe there's an argument I haven't thought of, but, uh, but somebody got to talk to me before I can tell you that everybody needs to know. Not everybody needs to know. Furthermore, the usual license to tell people terrible things when they are when other people need to know requires one a condition of reliability of the report. The standard case in Halakha is when you know from first hand experience. When you yourself have been witness to a criminal uh, a criminal behavior, evil behavior, you know something about a guy uh, even if it's uh, not criminal behavior, uh, your, your best friend happens to be a terrible worker and somebody wants to hire her as, as an employee. Well, you know that the person's a terrible worker. You have not only the right but the obligation to tell the employer that this is not a good uh, match for you. She's not going to do the job. That's not called much harm. But there you know yourself. What if you only heard from somebody else? Then you have a real obligation to first find out did the other person get the facts right? Where are the facts coming from? Is it just a rumor? Is there something to it? Even when you can't ascertain, you're not going to get two witnesses, which is the gold standard in Jewish law, for ascertaining whether something is true. The other time comes out that even if you don't know for sure that it's true, you're allowed to pass on information to somebody else 
if, if you meet two conditions, two conditions, when you don't know that it's true yourself, you can only pass on the condition if A, you yourself don't fall for it and believe it. You have an obligation to process it, to maybe believe it could be true, but not to decide in your own mind that it is. And that's very much not like the attitude of many people. As soon as they hear something that's negative about somebody else, ah, got to be true. Got to be true. That itself is a violation of Jewish law. Furthermore, even if you didn't believe that it's true, and you're passing it along in the proper way, you have to know that the farmer who, to whom you're relating that, that information is not going to use the information in a manner that will cause more injury to the person you're speaking about than would be allowed under Jewish law. Sometimes you tell stories about somebody, and the other party, instead of just saying, hmm, okay, that's interesting, I'll take mind, I'll watch more carefully, whatever, just uh, destroys the person, destroys the career, destroys the shit, whatever it is. Lots of ways in which the information that you convey can help B protect himself against A does damage to A that is not called for. This takes very, very serious weight. You have to know a lot of Jewish law. You don't have to be the, 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 the chief rabbi of the community, but you do have to know enough about Jewish law to know whether the consequences are really going to be appropriate to, to the crime. So, to just make blanket statements like, like I've seen in the literature, Lashon HaRat does not apply because it's for a good purpose, so it's just a distortion of the complexity of the laws of Lashon HaRat. The, yeah. Um, I want to do a little more clarification because that, um, you can't tell B something about A which could cause A uh, undue harm, but if you're not telling B something they need to know, you can end up hurting B. That's true. So, uh, whose right to you uh, are more important here? There's a, a major rule of thumb in Jewish law when you are when you're faced with a um, Silla and Charybdis when you have an immovable object and uh, an unstoppable force when you're left with two forces that are both pulling you in different directions what you have to do is be passive if you, you don't have the right to actively intervene to help me at the expense of me even if they see even they saw sort of a wrongdoer as a problem or this or that, but to cause greater harm, to, to save B from harm by causing A greater harm, who are you to choose B over A? So generally, that is the rule. Now, the liability is important. I have seen analyses, particularly about child abuse, that say, well, you know, in the case of, excuse me, child abuse, often the only people around are the children. And children, of course, they're invalid witnesses, and they say, yeah, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, because there's a halakha in Shulchan Aruch, and areas where the only people around who could know are people who ordinarily wouldn't be admissible in Jewish court, then you can accept them anyway. So, Kakana, the Kadmonim, it's brought in the Choshe Mishpat, it's in the Maman Hay, and it's true and it's irrelevant, or half irrelevant. It is true that under certain circumstances, and Shulchan Aruch mentions particularly cases like of like assault, where, where the only people around were children to see it, you will accept the testimony of, of children. Ramah quickly follows and says, but that's only the case, cites the response of the Maharik, that the only time that you accept the testimony of children is if there is somebody there making an actual claim, saying this is exactly what happened, and as part of the evidence, you uh, you, uh, you bring the children, uh, you bring in the children's testimony. When all you have is some something that children said, you're going to need more than that. Now, I'm not saying that you invalidate what children say, but you have to be very, very careful. Children can be brutally honest, and they can be helped to come up with very, very accurate.